The Bible does tell us in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21, to prove all things and to hold fast to that which is good. The thing I'm going to talk about today is going to be from the bottom of my heart. It is going to be based upon much study. It has been accompanied with a great amount of prayer because I, under no circumstances, ever want to say something that would be wrong and lead anyone in a wrong direction. So the things I'm going to say today are for every one of us to study, to pray about, think about, and then not let the traditions of men that have been opposed upon us during the Middle Ages stop us from restoring knowledge of God. There's been an age-old problem that has affected the church. It was not always this way, but it has been since about the 3rd century A.D., and that is the role of women in the church. 51% of all people on the face of the earth are women. The other 49% are men. Yet on the surface, it seems that women... And I'm talking about women in general all over the world, not just in the church, have been relegated to a position of a second-class citizen and a second-class Christian. And I do not feel that that is the way of God. But I wonder why this has happened. I believe that it's because of the tradition of men that's been imposed upon all of us through a system of Satan. I believe that it is Satan's system that has forced this upon the world and upon God's church. In Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28, this is the very creation week in which our Creator knelt down. He literally formed man from the dust of the ground. In verse 26 to 28, And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion. And it goes on and describes how that we were to have dominion or rulership over everything on planet earth. All things. We were to discover, we were to learn, we were to produce. We were to make the earth a literal jewel based upon all the information that we have learned. Verse 27 So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Now notice how he identifies the phrase man. Male and female created he them. So when the term man is used, in some cases it is literally a male of the species. But in many times when he's talking about man, it's talking about mankind, both male and female. Verse 28, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. So he told them to go on and have dominion or rulership over everything on planet earth. Now in Genesis chapter 2, chapter 1 is a description of the creation. Chapter 2 is literally telling an additional amount of information regarding chapter 1 and the creation week. Chapter 2, verse 21 to 24. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This is nothing more than a description showing that a woman was literally taken from the man. They were to become one flesh. But God also intended the husband and wife to become a working unit, helping each other and the many church found in their home, husband, wife, and their children. In Genesis 1, 
after God had looked down over his creation, everything that he had made, and before he rested on the seventh day called the Sabbath day, notice what he said about everything that he created in verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. There was no distinction between male and female. God said everything that he made, both male and female, was very good. Both parties, male and female, were intended for a specific purpose. God made it that way. He did not exclude women when he said everything was very good. God created a woman with the same mental capacities that he did a man, the same capabilities that women have the same capacity to store and retain knowledge and assimilate it for logical thinking just like a man does. So everything that God made was very good. He simply designed male and female to complement one another and to work with one another to help each other in attaining the kingdom of God. In Genesis chapter 3, we find the deception that finally came in the earth. Satan came as a brilliant individual, disguised as an angel of God, probably claiming to be God himself, and deceived Eve. Eve did not know. God created Adam and Eve with a simple childlike mind, even though they had full capabilities of using their mental processes. They did not know what sin was. They had never experienced evil. So they only knew good that God had put into their mind. And he instructed them not to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good or evil. So notice what God said to Eve as a result of this sin that she committed. And she was deceived into it. She did not know. Adam later, when he sinned, he knew better. Eve was deceived. She just did not know. Verse 16 of chapter 3 of Genesis. Unto the woman, he said, and this is God, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In sorrow you shall bring forth children, and your desire shall be to your husband, and he shall rule over you. I've got a question. How would God multiply her sorrow in childbearing? Sin brings every curse and wrong result, such as unhappiness, disease, the exact opposite of what living by God's law would produce. Literally, women, once they produce children, would see her children and even grandchildren's problems as a direct result of sin coming into the world. This has no relationship whatsoever with just specifically saying that women are evil. It does not. It simply says, as a result of sin, Eve, you will see children born into the world, they will follow in your footsteps, and they will sin, and you will live to see your children and your grandchildren, and each succeeding mother will see their children and grandchildren's sins as a result the sorrow that comes upon them, and it will fill your heart with sorrow because of all the heartaches they're now suffering because of sin. It does not put her down in any way and lift Adam, the male of the species, up. It's simply a logical statement that God is giving to her because of the sin that was performed. Now, let's notice in the New Testament yet another scripture concerning Eve and the sin that was committed. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, and the reason I'm going through this is because there has been a guilt trip placed upon the female of the human race. I don't believe that a woman under any circumstances should have any more guilt than a man because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 14 and 15. And Adam was not, I'm sorry, ver, yeah, verse 14. And Adam was not deceived, and yet he sinned, didn't he? This states clearly then, when you put it with Genesis chapter 1 or chapter 2, that Eve was deceived and she did not know any better. 
And yet by the time the sin came around and Adam seduced, was seduced by Eve, he knew better. And he did it anyway. So both were sinners and came short of the glory of God. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. If they continue, this is women, in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Now, on the surface, this particular verse seems to say that the only way a woman or any woman can be saved is by giving birth to children. Is this true? What about devout women who chose not to marry and accompanied the Apostle Paul in various trips that he had and served him? They chose of a voluntary, their own mind, not to marry, not to have children. Does this mean that they cannot be saved? It doesn't even make sense, does it? What about devout women? But because their fallopian tubes in some way would not allow an egg to come down and be fertilized in their womb. Could they help it? They didn't know about medical science and so on that could unstop the womb or the fallopian tubes. And as one woman that I knew could not have children until she went and a chiropractor told her to put a cushion under her back and it relieved some of the pressure that was blocking the fallopian tubes. And four children later, right in a row, all of a sudden she took the cushion out and never had a problem again. So you see, what about all those millions and millions of women throughout the centuries that had never heard the phrase, well, a man's sperm count is not high enough to fertilize your egg. And therefore they thought that it was them and the guilt trip was upon them that they could not have children. And they were barren. And as far as they knew from this one phrase in the Bible, and the way it has been taught, they honestly thought they could not be saved. And they had a guilt trip out of this world because of one phrase that says, Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. What about all these women? What about this verse? Could it be that people have not done their homework and that the Bible clearly makes it available to us, the meaning of this scripture? Could it be that the number one attribute of an all-wise and loving God is love? How would God, who is all-loving, tell a woman and give her a guilt trip that she could not be saved because she did not re reproduce children, all because Eve, who lived thousands of years before, was deceived in committing the first sin? God would not be love if he would not save people who were honest and sincere just because they could not have children. So what does this mean? Can the guilt trip placed upon 51% of the human race be lifted? Yes, it can, and biblically. Let's look at it. In verse 15, Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. The word saved is number 4982 in the Strong's Concordance of the Greek language. In the Thayer's Greek-English lexicon, and this has in detail the meanings of every Greek word. And if it has more than one meaning, just like the Webster's Dictionary, unabridged, will have up to ten meanings of some words. So this gives the various meanings. Here are some of the meanings of the word in the Greek language. It means to save, and so the King James translators put in the word saved. It means to keep safe and sound. Now listen to this. I want to read verse 14 again and put in the true meaning of this word, to keep safe and sound. Verse 14. Notwithstanding, she shall be kept safe and sound in childbearing. Look at this verse again in relation to Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, it said he would multiply your sorrow in childbearing, meaning you will see the results of the sins of your children and your children's children after them. And right here, if we understand that notwithstanding she shall be kept 
safe and sound in childbearing, this does not exclude her from salvation. It simply says, yes, I'm going to make it painful when you bear children so that you will remember the sin of your mother Eve. But I will keep you safe and sound when you deliver your children as long as you are having faith in me, you have love, and you, can, you live your lifestyle of holiness. As long as you ladies are obedient to God when you have children, you'll have pains. But God Almighty absolutely promises to keep you safe and sound through every delivery of your children. That's the meaning of that verse. Not that you can't be saved because of Eve's original sin. So childbearing has nothing to do with salvation, period. God simply promised that in birth pains He would guarantee you that He would keep you safe and sound if you continue in faith, love, and holiness. Now there are two scriptures and only two that I am aware of in the entirety of the Bible that churches use to say women cannot give special music before the congregation. The Church of Christ that I grew up in would never allow a woman with a beautiful voice to stand up in front of the congregation and sing a song. They would never let her play a piano solo because a woman is to keep silence in the church. In other words, women under no circumstances would be able to make even the slightest sound when the church is assembled together as a body, much less speak from the pulpit and give any type of instructions that would be helpful and beneficial to the rest of the congregation. Those two verses are 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 to 13. I'll read them. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be silence, or to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. I'm not going to discuss this right now. I'm going to come back to it. The other verse is 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34 and 35. Verse 34 and 35. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also says the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, just on the surface, just like it was in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, on the surface, something appears some way, doesn't it? And if we went just on surface knowledge of reading that, and that's all, we would have to say that a woman could never give special music. She could never lead a prayer. She could never stand in the pulpit and speak edifying words that will help you to learn and to be lifted up and character development for the kingdom of God. But are they the way they look on the surface? Before we go into depth in these two verses, let's go to other scriptures because there can be no scripture in the entirety of the Bible that flat out contradicts another. It cannot be. So let's go into the Old Testament first of all to the book of Judges. The book of Judges and chapter 4. Judges chapter 4. I'll start with verse 1 and go through verse 6. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan. And it goes on and tells the various rulers of the area at that time. Now notice verse 3. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Why? Because here was a Gentile king that was going to send 900 chariots of iron against them in war. And 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. Now look at verse 4. And Deborah, a prophetess. Notice the last phrase. She judged Israel at that time. 
And she dwelt, and it tells her dwelling place. And then in verse 6, she sent and called Barak, and it describes on through the rest of the chapter how God was using the woman Deborah, a prophetess. And he actually gave instructions to the men of Israel who headed the military how to deliver Israel from the hands of the Gentiles in Canaan. Deborah was a prophetess. Israel came to her from all over the area for one specific reason. It said she judged Israel. The word judge means make judicial decisions. Just like a judge sitting in the courtroom making judicial decisions in the United States courts system today. This was what Deborah did. She was, the in, she was in the highest authority in the nation of Israel of that day. And notice what else it said. The word prophetess is number 5031 in the Hebrew Strong's Concordance. It only has one meaning and no other. This does not even mean to foretell the future. That's a totally different Hebrew word. This means an inspired woman. God Almighty inspired this woman with his Holy Spirit to lead Israel in that day. There were no men that were willing to take the leadership of a nation of Israel and Deborah was chosen by God. He inspired her by the Holy Spirit. And the Hebrew word 5031 comes from the root word number 5030 which is an inspired man. It's simply the feminine word for prophet, meaning prophetess. And they heeded her inspiration. They did not deny that the great God, Yahweh of the Old Testament, inspired Deborah, and they heeded her directions, and they won the victory. In 2 Chronicles chapter 34, 2 Chronicles chapter 34, once again, it describes God's use of women in the Old Testament. And remember, God did not write everything down. He just didn't. He only wrote certain things by which we could learn. In 2 Chronicles 34, I'm going to break in the thought of the chapter. I'll go to verse 20 through verse 28 and summarize certain verses. But the king of Israel once again needed information from God. Verse 20. And the king commanded Hilkiah and, ah and Ahikam, the son of, anyway, and it goes on and describes them. Verse 21. Go inquire of the Lord for me, for them that are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. So what happened was that they had been in captivity and one of the priests went into the temple of God. They found the books of the law. All of a sudden they start reading some of the books of the law. And it tells why they went into captivity. If you'll not listen. You'll not keep my commandments, my statutes, and my judgments. Then I'll bring all these curses upon you. So the king wanted to know from an inspired person. That was recognized in all of Israel. What in the world they were to do about the finding of this book. Well, let's go. And he said very clearly, Go and inquire of the Lord for me. Verse 22, And Hilkiah and they that the king had appointed went to Huldah the prophetess. They went to a woman. Notice what the last phrase says, And they spake to her to that effect, telling the whole story. But what I want you to see in this particular verse, this was Huldah the prophetess, and it says in parentheses down there, now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college. Did you know they had colleges to train prophets and prophetesses? She was living what we call today in a dormitory and she was being taught by such great men as Elijah, Elisha, and all of these various prophets. And they had a college right there where women were trained and inspired of God Almighty just like men were. 
Have we ever seen this in the Bible before? Shocking, isn't it? It's true, though. It's right there. They haven't added it lately. I bet it's in every one of our Bibles and everybody that ever hears this tape or sees this video. Nobody snuck it in over the night. Well, anyway, when we go on down and see in the context, here is a woman prophetess, and the word is identical to the one which I have already mentioned before, number 3031, which means an inspired woman. And she gave information as to what to do. And as a direct result of the king of Israel, who did not know God's ways, but because he had a repentant heart, she said, all the sins that, have been, that are going to come upon the country will not come until after your death. Verse 27, because your heart was tender and you did humble yourself before God. And he heard the words of a woman and they went to someone who was inspired of God. And it was a woman. Well, what about the New Testament? Jesus, our very Messiah, had now come into the human flesh. He died to deliver us from sin and death. We owe everything to Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. Notice who God the Father, through Jesus Christ, offered this deliverance from our sins and death to. I know that's a dangling preposition, but still, who did God offer salvation to? Let's go to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. And let's read verse 14. And believers were the more added to the Lord. Multitudes, both of men and women. When Jesus Christ crucified was preached, women received Jesus Christ and therefore salvation just like men. Has God changed? No. He's going to save both male and female, and I think we'll understand why before I'm through with a sermon. Chapter 8. Chapter 8 of the book of Acts. I want you to notice now who were baptized into the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of all their sins. Not just believed, but were literally baptized. Verse 12. But when they believe Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. And I personally have baptized many or most of the women in this congregation. You are a child of God just like your husband, your fiancé, your boyfriend or man friend are just like your minister. We all are in the body of Jesus Christ. You ladies are not a second-class citizen, and you are not a second-class Christian, and I hope that I would never, under any circumstances, ever give you the feeling, personally, that you are. I have tried never to do that because of the scriptures that God Almighty has shown, and we're to learn from these. Women were a part of the church in the first century just like the men were. There was no difference. Did you realize that in the Old Testament the man had to be circumcised in the flesh but he was, it was done representing the entire family? But now in the New Testament not only are men circumcised in heart but women must be circumcised in heart also. Both men and women are required to repent and to put off their carnal human nature. Both are. That tells me God is going to save women just like he is men. Acts 8 again. Acts chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. I want you to notice who was persecuted for believing and being baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. Verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto Stephen's death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. 
And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Verse 3. As for Saul, see a miracle hadn't been performed in his life yet, he made havoc of the church. Entering into every house, modern day Nazi Gestapo tactics. Saul got absolute written permission from the Pharisees that rule the temple and hail men and women committed them to prison. Ladies were put in prison just like men because they accepted Jesus Christ and they also were baptized into his name. Chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus. He wasn't satisfied just with destroying both men and women, believers in Jerusalem. He wanted to extend it to all the area. And desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they be men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Women suffered for the name of Jesus Christ, just like men. Are women second-class citizens? Not on your life. They have nerve endings, they have feelings, they have emotions, just like men. And they suffered and died for the name of Jesus Christ. Women are going to be exalted in the kingdom of God with their new body, just like men are. God guarantees that by His Holy Spirit that's in you. What is a woman's status in the church? And what actions should she be involved in? Let's make sure we look at the Bible and get examples from it. Chapter 9 of Acts, verse 36 and verse 39. Because we must prove all things... And hold fast to that which is good. Verse 36, it's talking about a woman by the name of Lydia. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation, I'm sorry, is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. Notice, she was full of good works toward other people. And she said she did many alms deeds. In other words, alms is giving to the poor. She would make clothes out of her own pocketbook. She would go and buy materials and make people clothes who were poor. Verse 39. She died and the church was very sorry about it. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber and all the widows stood by him weeping. And showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. So this woman did many wonderful deeds for not only the church brethren, but for poor people. Women can do these things just like a man can. God does not restrict you in any way whatsoever from doing good. To be exact, every single one of us were bought with a price... The body of Jesus Christ, his death, his shed blood, and we are required to do good. That's why Jesus has purchased us, so that we will do good from this day forward. In Romans chapter 16, verse 1 through 3, I commend, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the Roman church, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, Here is a woman that Paul is saying, look, I commend this woman to you, which is a servant of the church, which is at Syncra, and that you receive her in the Lord as become saints, and that you assist her in whatsoever business she has need of you. For she has been a succorer of many and of myself also. Notice now what this woman has done. It says she has been a servant of the church. And it even identifies the city where she was serving the people. 
Now, what does the word servant mean? It's number 1249 in the Greek Strong's Concordance. It has several meanings, and every one of these meanings apply. It means that she ran errands. It means that she attended upon people who came into the church. She waited upon people. She served those people. She also was a teacher of the people. And he said, whatever she has need of, you, whether you're male or female, in the church here, whatever she asks of you, help her out in the service she's performing. Ladies have an important role in the church of the living God. They're not second-class citizens. God has put authority within the church, and we'll discuss that in a moment. But this woman was a true assistant to the apostle Paul. And he even instructed other people to assist her and anyone that was with her in Paul's business in the church. In 1 Timothy chapter, or 1 Peter, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going to begin to see what God instructs as far as authority is concerned within the church. This is the key. God has given in the home a certain structure of authority and it carries right over into the church there is no difference in first peter chapter 3 verse 1 through 7 likewise you wives be in subjection to your own husbands that if any obey not the word they also may without the word be won by the conversation the actual greek means conduct not just talking but everything you do from preparing meals to the way you clean your house to the way that you rear your children to the way you work in the fields at that time because the ladies did go out and work with the men. Everything you do, if you're a convert, you make sure you're setting the right example for that non-converted husband. Verse 4, while they, the non-converted, behold your chaste con conduct coupled with fear of God. Verse 3, whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning. In other words, he says, look, you're not to try to look like the local prostitute. No, that's not the idea. You are to be adorned inside. It's an attitude of mind, your character development. That's what you're to show off to your husband. There's nothing wrong with dressing up looking nice. We are to look nice before each other. But... The heart is what is to reflect our outward appearance. We're to do it because our heart is right before God. Verse 4, But let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. Notice what God wants of a lady, of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And it's after this manner that the holy women of old conducted themselves. Now, the last part of verse 5. Being in subjection under their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. That simply meant master, or I recognize that you are the head of the family. It does not mean that men can mistreat their women. All God is doing is giving a responsibility when you discuss things back and forth in the family God has placed the man who is to be the provider mainly for the family has given a tiebreaker, you might say. When you cannot come or you have a disagreement over something, then God has given the husband the right to break the tie. And the woman is to be submissive in that unless he asks her to break God's law. If he ever asks you to break God's law, you never have to follow that direction. It's no different before a king or before a ruler. If God says, do something, we are to do it. And he's given the husband the final authority. Verse 7. Likewise, you husbands dwell with them, meaning your wives, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. And that's not mentally. That's only we've been given 40% more muscle tissue to be the provider and the workhorse for the family to provide the living and protect the family. 
as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So from this scripture, we've seen that there is authority within the family. God placed the man as a loving authority over the entire family unit. The wife is in second command. She is in authority second to her husband in their mini kingdom. This is not a second class position at all. It is just a division of authority within the family. She recognizes the dominant role that God has given to the man. If she does that and does not usurp authority over her husband or over the male leadership of the church, she is doing right. She has done nothing wrong. That is what God wants. Let's go to Titus now, chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verse 3 to 5. Titus chapter 2, verse 3 to 5. The aged women or older women, it doesn't necessarily mean just in number of years, but aged in the faith, those who have been in the church longer than others. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as become holiness. Women are to set the example. Not false accusers, not given to much wine, Teachers of good things. What did that say? It says women who have been in the faith longer and are older in the faith are to be teachers of good things. That they may teach the young women to be sober or to be discreet, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good to other people, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Right here, women are to teach good things. You ladies are to teach. You are. The Bible says so. You are to teach the younger women, the younger in the faith, how that they should act toward their husband, toward their children, as a good keeper at home, Whatever the conduct of a godly woman, those older in the faith have the responsibility to teach the newer people in the faith to do those things. It is your obligation before God to do it. Let's go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Verse 1 through 8. As long as a woman does not usurp authority over her husband and lust for power, then women are to teach. The Bible says so. And specifically, they are to teach the younger women in the faith so they can grow up and live properly before God. Verse 1 through 8 in Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. He's not saying men. He's saying brethren, all male and female, who have been baptized into Jesus Christ. We are all to present ourselves a living sacrifice. We're to be holy, acceptable unto God. That is only our reasonable service because we've been bought back from death. Verse 2, be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, verse 3, this is very important. For I say through the grace given unto me, that's the Apostle Paul, not Dave Smith. I'm only quoting the scriptures. To every man that is among you. I want to stop right there. The word man in the Strong's Concordance means a human being, one, an individual. Whether it is male or female, it means One, I say through the grace given to me to every one that is among you. Now, is every one of you out there, whether you're male or female, we're all among each other, aren't we? Not to think of oneself more highly than he ought to think. 
but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to everyone the measure of faith. Now, if you have been baptized into the name of Jesus Christ, you have God's Holy Spirit. It's an absolute promise. One of the parts of the gift of, of the Spirit is faith. And God will give that measure of faith. And it states here that he will give it to both male and females. It's a human being he's talking about, not the male of the species. Verse 4. For as we have many members, that's the whole church that is meeting right here or in another city, in one body, and all members have not the same office. So we being many, that's all of us in this room, are one body in Christ. And every one members one of another. See? It's individual, whether you're male or female. Verse 6. Having them then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us. Whether prophecy, and that word means speak under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, according to the proportion of faith. Verse 7. Or ministry. Or he that teaches on teaching. This is instructing both male and female. Whatever God has given you the capability and the gift for, that is how you're to serve the church. Verse 8. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. And the pronoun modifies man back in verse 3. Which is a human being or one individual. And it is sexless. Either male or female. And it goes on and lists all of these various gifts that God gives to people. Individuals. Whether you're male or female. Then notice verse 9. He says let love be without dissemination. In other words, no matter what God has given each one of us to do to benefit the rest of the church, love is the overriding factor in everything we do. That's the purpose behind it, or we should sit down and not say a word or not even serve someone else if it's from a motive that is not love for the benefit of the other person that we're serving. So I want to summarize this now. It lists the various gifts that God has distributed to all those who compose the one body of Jesus Christ. Some gifts listed here are prophecy and teaching. These are for all the church that make up the one body of Jesus Christ. Now I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'll do a good deal of summarizing through these particular verses. 1 through 13. Verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. Then it talks about how we came out of being Gentiles of the past. Then verse 3. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed or anathema. And that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Spirit. Now notice in verse 4. Now there are diversities or different gifts but the same Holy Spirit. There are differences of ministries. The King James says administrations. And if you have a more expensive Bible there will be a number by it and it corrects it in the center column. It's ministries. This is only one ministry that God is using today. There are others out there. But it's the same Lord. There are diversities of operations. God operates in different ways. But it's the same Holy Spirit that works for the benefit of all of us. Notice now verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. That is a very jumbled up and hard to understand sentence. We're going to break it down. But the manifestation or the making known of the operation of the Holy Spirit is given. Notice now it says to every man. The word man is number 1533 in the Strong's Concordance. And it literally means to tell one a thing. 
But the manifestation or the making known of the operation of the Spirit is given to tell one thing to profit all. So it's not just given to a man, but it is to, is to tell something to profit everybody in the room. When we go down and we read verse 8, it says, for to, for to one, because it must agree with a phrase to tell one a thing. It's an individual, not a male of the species. Verse 8, to one is given, one gift. Then to one is given another, verse 9, to another, and then another, to one is given. And never does it say only to men is this gift given, but it is referring to both male and female. One is an individual who is baptized into the church of the living God. So the Spirit works with individuals, either male or female, one why would God give a woman the gift of discerning of spirits, which is demons, but not give her the gift of prophecy or speak under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? We saw that God used Deborah to rule Israel. She was a judge, and she was an inspired woman, and the Hebrew word proved it. Why would he not give someone the gift? of speaking before the congregation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit when he gave to Huldah a prophetess and who resided in a college being trained as a prophetess in the city of Jerusalem. Why would he not do it today if he did it then? Or was it the tradition of men? In the last two years at both Feast of Tabernacles, 1988 and 1989, I knew that a demon or many demons had come to the feast site. I knew the exact day they came. And I rushed out into the parking lot and saw the individual who had had demons coming around him for seven consecutive years. This is in 1988. The night before I went into the parking lot and found who it was, a woman in the church of the living God woke up in the middle of the night raised other people in her family and relations and told them there were demons at the feast. God had given her a gift of discerning of spirits. And she told me the next day. And yet she didn't know that I knew it and I didn't know that she knew it. God works and he gives gifts. And the same thing happened at the feast in 1989. All Male and female are baptized into the body. They drink of the one spirit, God's Holy Spirit. God provides gifts within the church, whether it is male or female. But I think there's a legitimate why that needs to be asked. The Bible tells us why God provides for both sexes to help within the body of Jesus Christ. I want to turn now to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3, verse 26 to 28. For you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And we saw in the book of Acts that both men and women were baptized... And that book was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit never said women cannot be baptized. Women cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Women are not second class citizens. They are children of the living God. Verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. That means their God, when he looks down at the hearts of human beings who have accepted Jesus Christ, he never looks upon their nationality. No matter who they are or where they come from, they are a Christian. There is neither bond nor free. He doesn't look at our financial status, whether we're behind the iron curtain or the bamboo curtain or in a free country. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. I believe these verses absolutely prove that when God looks down in this 
church assembly that we have today. He does not see Judy and Tom Younger as different sexes in his eyes. He looks at them as his children. There is a reason for it. He doesn't look at one of us as a sex in his eyes. Here's why. In Matthew chapter 22, the Pharisees and the scribes of his day did not know the scriptures. They didn't know the purpose for which God made male and female. They did not know and understand the purpose for the resurrection from the dead. If they had known and they had understood, they would not have been down upon the women and used the phrase, which they did in those days, just like many people today, that men try to keep their women pregnant and barefooted. That way, they're not threatened by them. No, that's not God's way. Matthew chapter 22. I'll start in verse 23. The same day came to Jesus the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection. That means there's no hope. Once you die, that's it. You're like Rover, dead all over. And they asked Jesus, verse 24, saying, Master, Moses said if a man die having no children... His brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now, there were with us seven brothers. These were physical brothers. And the first, when he had married a wife, well, he died. He became deceased. And having no children or no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second and the third, they all died. All the way down to the seventh, he finally died. And last of all, the, women died, the woman died also. She outlived them all. Sort of like today. Verse 28. Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all were married to her. They had sexual relationships with her. They were one in marriage. Verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, You Pharisees, scribes, Sadducees, doctors of the law that think you know everything, you do err. Not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they, this is men and women, neither marry. Why? Because physical sexes are to reproduce after our kind in this life only. Nor are given in marriage. Sex and the differences in the two today is for a temporary time. Once we receive our new glorified body, there will be no differences sex-wise, male and female. But are as the angels of God in heaven will not need the reproductive organs of both male and female then because we'll have everlasting life. But is touching the resurrection of the dead and he goes on. But the whole point of this is when we receive our glorified bodies, there will be no need for sex. We'll not depend upon it for reproduction. We will all be kings and priests ruling in God's kingdom. Whether you're male or female, you will all have the responsibility of ruling in God's kingdom. God looks at us as one, not different sexes. But for the present, physical body, we have to have certain authority in our meetings. So the book of 1 Corinthians is a very corrective book. This book is not written because the church had it together. No, it was the exact opposite. The book of 1 Corinthians was written because they had little to no knowledge of God's ways, God's purposes. So let's go now and start discovering what women can do in the church that is legal in God's sight. We've already seen some of them can do good things. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1 through 16. Be you followers of me, the Apostle Paul, even as I am of Christ. He doesn't ask that any of us do anything different than he would do if they believed he was following Jesus Christ. I say the same thing. I don't want you to ever follow me unless I show you in the Bible. That's what it says. 
Did Paul, and we saw the scriptures where he actually had women serving and they actually went and they, he put them in charge and people, even men, served them in certain limited capacities? Yes, we saw it right in the Bible. We read it with our own eyes. Verse 2, Now I praise you, brethren, and he's talking to the whole church, both male and female, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. What were some of those ordinances? Look very carefully at the next couple of verses. But I would have you know that the head of every man, and that means a male of the species. Steve over here is a male of the species. That's who he's writing this to. The head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. This is the authority structure that God has given for the church. And the head of Christ is God. So we have God the Father at the top, Jesus Christ next, head of the church. And he's set within the church for, to make sure there is no unnecessary distractions, to make sure there is authority and everything is done decently and in order. He's made the man the head of the wife. And then they jointly rule their many kingdom, called their children, the subjects of the kingdom. And when there is a decision that has to be made that they disagree upon, the man is the head of the wife. He has been given the authority by God Almighty to break the tie. Verse 3, every man, and this is one of the ordinances that Paul gave to them and he's having to correct them upon. Every man praying or prophesying, and it means speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, just as we saw the woman Deborah and Huldah in the Old Testament. Only this is referring to a man, and the word man is literally man. It's the male gender of the species. If he has his head covered, dishonors his head. Who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is the head of the man. It said so. And Jesus Christ did not have long hair. All the pictures are perverted. Jesus is not a sinner. And it says here, if a man prays or stands up and speaks under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and if he has long hair, as the whole context shows, then he is dishonoring Jesus Christ. There is no place for a man to have long hair. He can have it styled to look good, but not to look like a woman. Verse 5, remember this is one of the ordinances that Paul passed on to them. But every woman praying that prays or prophesies. Now what did the man do? He prayed and prophesied. With her head uncovered. In other words, she has to have a longer hairstyle to show she's un, under the authority of her head. Dishonors her head. Who is her head? The Bible just said the head of every woman is her husband. So if a woman were to come up here and lead an opening or closing prayer or to give a sermonette, and she didn't have a proper length of hair and style that would fit a woman, she is bringing dishonor before the whole church to her husband. This is the ordinance that Paul laid down in Scripture. And no other Scripture in the Bible can violate this instruction. So is this telling us that a woman cannot pray in church? No, this was addressed to the brethren. And that's both male and female who were baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. Verse 4, For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. In other words, just shave all her hair off. Because it's a shame for a woman to look like a man. And the Old Testament told us clearly that women are not to wear clothes that were made and manufactured and designed for a man. A woman is to wear clothes that is designed for a female figure. And not to put on a man's that's not designed for her obvious differences. Verse 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. For as much as he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Once again, giving the authoritative line in the church. Verse 8, for the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. That does not make her a second class citizen. It, God just had to have some way for authority to be distributed through the family unit and the church. 
And since the man has been given 40% more muscular tissue to provide for the family and to protect the family, he has given him the final say. But if he doesn't do it in a loving way, he's still disobeying the commandment of our Savior. Verse 10. For this cause ought the woman to have, notice it says power on her head. No. When you've got a more expensive Bible, it has a number that corrects the mistranslation. It says a covering in sign that she is under the power of her husband. That's why she is to have longer hair. Nevertheless, verse 11, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. God originally took a rib from Eve and made the woman. But then on the other hand, women bear the children that produce the males, don't they? So we're both to be one in Jesus Christ and not fight and struggle against each other. Verse 13, Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered or without her longer hair? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Right there, it tells us what he's talking about, this covering, its hair length. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering or the actual Greek word is veil. Amen. In the Middle East, the Arabs require many, or they used to, whether they still do, in some of the countries they required women to wear a veil over their face, to cover up their face. God doesn't require that. A woman's long hair is her veil, showing she's in submission to her husband and to the male leadership of the church. Notice what it says in verse 16. This is one continuous context. It says, if any man seem to be contentious, well, he's talking about contentious about this doctrine of male or female praying or speaking in church. We have no such custom, neither the churches of God. We're not to argue and fuss. God has made women, he's made men, he's given both the Holy Spirit of God. We are all one in Christ Jesus, but there is authority within the church. Now we're going to identify the two scriptures that is always used to tell women they can never have a part in God's church. Now they can die for Jesus Christ, they can experience torture, but they can never let the gifts that God has given them ever be used. No, that's not fair, and that's not right before God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40, Paul summarizes everything he says in this chapter. Let all things be done decently, and in order. So he is correcting a situation that caused turmoil turmoil and tumultuous circumstances within the church. Now let's go back in context, realizing that he is correcting a circumstance. Verse 34 and 35. Let your women keep silence in the church, churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But to be under obedience. Notice the word, they are commanded. That was never in the original text. And if you have a more expensive Bible, it's in italics, showing that it was added by the translators, the good old King James boys, to fit their version of the Bible. Verse 35. As if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. That sounds like a woman can never speak in the church. Remember, we've been showing authority so far between the husband and the male leadership. But what is this speaking that women are forbidden to do in the church? Is it to pray? When we saw in 1 Corinthians 11 that one of the ordinances that Paul gave to the church was that women could pray and even speak under the inspiration to the rest of the congregation. The word speak in the Greek strong concordance is number 2980. It means to utter words. And this same number 2980 is compared to other Greek words that have meanings that talk about individuals speaking. 
Number 2980 is compared to number 3004, and it says it specifically means, in this context, an, an extended or har random harangue to boast. In other words, this simply means that a woman cannot come up before the congregation and then she had a disagreement with someone else on a particular passage. So she starts a long, lengthy, haranguing argument to show that she's right and somebody else is wrong. And it also means that she has no right whatsoever to come up here and to be boastful and proud and arrogant before the congregation. She would not be in subjection to her own husband if she did that. This is all this verse is telling women. When 1 Corinthians 11 said you can pray, you can speak to the congregation if God has given you those gifts. But you must be under the authority of your husband and under the authority of the male leadership. You cannot come up here and give a long haranguing argument against what somebody else has already said. If you will learn anything, settle it outside in private. At home, ask your husband. If he can't explain it and straighten it up in your mind, call for the ministry. And they can help to settle it. But you don't use the pulpit to create uproar in the church. Men are not to do that either. But especially it's talking about women because women are to be under the authority of their husband. Well, this does not forbid a woman who is in submission to her husband and the male leadership of the church and proves that she is in submission by humility and the way she conducts her life. It does not forbid her from speaking and praying in the assembly of the church of God. Now let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> Verse 11 through 13. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man but to be in silence. This is used, and they don't go into the true meaning of all the Greek words, because see, when you translate things from one language to another, sometimes you'll have a phrase in one language, and you can't bring that whole phrase over into another. So you take a word that is closest to the meaning of that other language, but it does not always bring over the true meaning. And this is the case here. It's very evident. Just like it was in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, where a woman it made it appear that she could only be saved by having children, which we know that is not the case. Well, let's go into what this means. Under what conditions should a woman keep silent and not teach in the church? This is the question that has to be answered. We've already seen other scriptures that said she could teach. The Bible cannot contradict itself in any way. The word teach is number 1321 in the Strong's Concordance. When you go to the Thayer's Greek lexicon, English lexicon of the New Testament, it gives all the meanings of the words, and it gives them in detail. Number 1321, Thayer's literally means a woman cannot deliver a didactic discourse. What in the world is a didactic discourse? We can just abbreviate it, good old DD. <laughs> no women, you can't DD today. <laughs> what does this mean? Webster's unabridged dictionary of the English language says that didactic means to teach moral lessons. In other words, a woman can never come to the pulpit and deliver an authoritative final decision on a moral principle. Just like in the family unit, if a husband and wife cannot agree upon something, the man's final decision stands. So in the church, if we discuss a, a moral issue, a woman can never come into the pulpit 
and give the final, this is it, you must do it decision. It takes the man to do it. So women must follow the principle in the Old Testament, in God's law, that the man is the head of the woman. A man must give the authoritative final decision on all moral issues concerning the church over to the man and let him describe it to the church. Not one scripture forbade a woman from speaking except if she creates disturbances and tries to usurp authority over a man to make final moral decisions. Brethren, I hope and pray that all of us will look to Jesus Christ in this matter and that we will all come to the same conclusion that our women are first-class Christians.